All right. Um, it is my pleasure to bring on stage uh, an incredible uh, CEO uh, for an incredible company. Uh, you may not have heard of Samumed, uh, but it is one of the most miraculous companies in the vitality and longevity space that I know of. Uh, Dr. Osmond Kibar um, uh, has uh, two bachelor's degrees, one in electrical engineering from, uh, from Caltech. Uh, he has uh, a MS and a PhD in biophotonics and uh, optoelectronics from UCSD. And what you're about to hear from him is nothing more than extraordinary. Uh, this is a company that you may not have heard of, but it's a $13 billion private company uh, decoding uh, how the human cell and hopefully vitality and longevity of life is. So please welcome Dr. Osman Kibar. Thank you, Peter. Pleasure. Good morning. So we have a drug development platform where we are able to restore the health of any tissue in the body back to how it was before. Uh, of course, there are some regenerative medicine applications. You know, in these cases, if uh, a certain tissue, let's say you wore out your cartilage, then we have a small molecule drug that would regenerate it back to a healthy level. But then there are certain diseases where there is too much replenishment going on, for example, cancer, in which case our drugs have an antiproliferative effect. And the last one is if our own immune systems are attacking a certain tissue in the body, then we have these anti-inflammatory drugs. So the problem we all face is that as we age, our health deteriorates, and then we die. That's what we call aging, and we usually take it for granted. And to address this problem, uh, I want to give a quick background on stem cell biology uh, in the simplest terms. When the first fetus is formed, the egg meets the sperm, we have our first embryonic stem cell. That's the top layer. Think of it as a pyramid, so we're talking uh, about the peak of the pyramid. Embryonic means that stem cell has the capacity to turn into any other type of cell in the body. Then, as the fetus starts growing, that embryonic stem cell multiplies into more embryonic stem cells, 2, 4, 8, 16, and so on. And at some point, they start coordinating and communicating with each other, and they partially differentiate, the key word is partial, and uh, they differentiate into all the different types of progenitor stem cells. That's the middle layer. Now, each progenitor stem cell is in charge of a particular system in the body. For example, mesenchymal stem cells are in charge of the musculoskeletal system. So they further differentiate and turn into bone, cartilage, tendon, ligament, muscle, but they cannot turn into a skin cell or a brain cell or a heart cell. Dermal stem cells, everything to do with the skin, epithelial, internal organs, ependymal, nervous system, so on and so forth. So we probably have maybe 12, 15 different types of progenitor stem cells. And when they further differentiate, they form all the adult tissues and organs. At that point, there is no stem cellness left. That's the bottom layer. And now we have the body. Now, this is all happening in the womb. When the baby is born, all the embryonic stem cells are gone. The progenitor stem cells, however, they remain embedded in our local tissues until the day we die, and their job is to repair and replenish and basically maintain the health of the specific tissues they are responsible for. For example, we break a bone, mesenchymal stem cells jump into action, uh, uh, first they multiply, then they differentiate down to osteoblasts, which are the bone-building cells, calcium deposition and so on, and they, they repair the bone. Now, instead, we go out running, we wear out our cartilage. The same mesenchymal stem cells, this time, they multiply but go down a chondrocyte lineage, which are the cartilage-building cells. And the key developmental pathway that regulates the proliferation and the differentiation of these stem cells is what's called the WINT pathway, WNT. You can think of First of all, a biological pathway is just a collection of biomolecules, so genes, proteins, peptides, enzymes, and when they work together, they satisfy a specific function in the body. In this case, stem cell regulation. 
So you can think of it as a multi-parameter modulation scheme where certain combination of genes and proteins can get down-regulated or up-regulated in a specific uh, uh, combination. And then the mesenchymal stem cells know whether they should be making more bone, more cartilage, how much, when to stop, or whether they should just sit back and wait until they're needed the next time around. Now, quick word on the wind pathway. What's very relevant for drug development is that the wind pathway is extremely well conserved across all animal species. What that means is all the genes and proteins that make up the pathway, they're not just similar but identical across all animal species. So when we are trying to identify a drug molecule, let's say, and we show that it grows cartilage in rats, it's basically 100% certainty that the same molecule is going to grow cartilage in dogs, monkeys, and humans alike. So by the time we put uh, one of our disease programs into the clinic, into human testing, we basically have the efficacy box more or, like, uh, more or less checked. And <clears throat> as we get older, the various signaling levels of the wind pathway start drifting out of balance. And every time that happens, there's a disease associated with that. So if the, healthy, the wind levels get out of the healthy range such that there is not enough bone replenishment, then we have osteoporosis. Not enough cartilage, osteoarthritis. Not enough hair, we go bald. Too many colon cells, now we have colon cancer. So every time some imbalance happens, for whatever reason, it could be your lifestyle choices, you know, you're a smoker, drinker, sports injuries, genetic mutations, or just by virtue of aging. The result is the same. And what we do is we develop small molecule drugs that restore the various wind activity levels back into a healthy range at which point the body's own machinery takes over and they repair and replenish, sometimes up, sometimes down, the various tissues that are in distress, that have been diseased or damaged. So that's the gist of our platform. Now, we have a number of programs that uh, are currently in human testing. The, one of the most advanced ones is we have a molecule that can regenerate cartilage. So, these are pictures of uh, uh, an animal's knee. The left side, the red lines in the middle of the picture, that's cartilage. And then in the middle picture, in this model, we uh, uh, clip all ligaments, ACL, MCL, PCL, so there's no structural support. The animals walk around for a couple of months. Bone grinds on bone, cartilage wears out. Inflammation sets in and they develop osteoarthritis, just like in humans. And then, this particular drug, it's a single injection, injected into the synovial fluid, into the knee, and over a matter of months, it grows the cartilage back, that's the picture on the right, even back to healthier levels than before, if you compare the thickness of that cartilage with the picture on the left, and inflammation is suppressed, the bone spurs are eliminated, and this is while the ligaments are still clipped. So it's able to restore the health of the overall joint above and beyond the wear and tear that's going on. So we took this molecule into humans. These are human x-rays from clinical trials. The picture on the left, the right edge, that's the medial, that's the inside of the knee. Basically, when a human uh, gets osteoarthritis, the most weight-bearing point in the body is the medial of the knee. When he loses the cartilage, the top and bottom bone plates come closer together. There's a corresponding increase on the lateral side, on the outside of the knee. And then again, single injection, we grow cartilage on the inside of the knee, and the two bone plates tilt back to a healthy level. And there is a corresponding decrease on the lateral side. So for this program, we finished a phase one, a phase two, a phase two B, and we are planning to go into our phase three pivotal studies 
next quarter. Another program, if you take the same injection but now inject it into the spine, we are able to regenerate a whole new disc. So again on the left, that's the disc of a healthy but old animal's disc. The one in the middle, we basically removed the disc altogether, it's completely destroyed. Single injection, the picture on the right, we're able to regenerate a whole new disc. And it's the same story such that the stem cells don't know how to regenerate old cells. So when they regenerate and restore the health, it actually restores that particular tissue back to how you had it as a teenager, at the peak of your health. So this is also in human trials. <coughs> Another program, tendon repair. On the left, that's a healthy tendon. You have these thin, long filaments. The picture in the middle, that's when the tendon structure has been lost. Immune cells have penetrated. In this case, the drug is a lotion. You just put it on over the damaged tendon once a day, and we are able to repair the tendon back to how it was before, the one on the right. So for this one, again, we finished the phase one, another skin sensitization safety study. And with this one, at this point, there is no approved drug for tendon repair, not even a painkiller. And uh, we went to the FDA. FDA said, well, you got to design your own questionnaire, your own patient reported outcome, <laughs> such that, <laughs> and then clinically validate it. And we'll use that questionnaire to assess you moving forward. So we did that, we just got the green light, so we're going into phase two uh, early next year. <laughs> Thank you. Another program, we have an oncology pill. This one, we designed it as a pill so it goes everywhere in the body such that it treats both primary tumors and metastatic tumors because you never know where the tumor uh, has metastasized. This is the same pill applied to eight different indications. Again, in these pictures, these are all primary human tumors implanted into animals. At the top, you can see you know, colorectal, pancreatic, triple negative breast, liver, and in each case, y-axis shows the size of the tumor, x-axis is a matter of three weeks. If untreated, the tumors keep growing, and when treated with our drug, we basically inhibit growth of the tumors and eliminate them. And this one is also in phase one, and anecdotally, we have a couple of patients that have been using our drug for months now under a compassionate use. And uh, we're glad to say both patients are doing well. You know, one of them it was a pancreatic cancer patient in her late 30s. Terminal, all treatments had failed. Six months later, she's traveling. She has gained 40 pounds. She's dating, you know, back to normal. So, so far, so good. Thank you. <laughs> Another program, uh, this is for Alzheimer's. On the left, you see a slice of a healthy animal's brainstem. And then these are transgenic animals, you know, with a specific genetic mutation where they develop Alzheimer's early onset. The one in the middle, all those dark spots are the neurofibrillary tangles. And then again, we have a different pill. You take it once a day. And the, this pill has the property where it is able to penetrate the blood-brain barrier, but at the same time, it accumulates more in the brain tissue than in the blood. So you take a small dose every day, clears from the blood, so there are no side effects, but then day after day, it accumulates in the brain and gets to an efficacious dose. So we've also done uh, functional tests, you know, we've looked at cognition, uh, spatial memory, motor function, even anxiety levels, everything goes back to normal. And besides these, you know, I'm not showing every program we have, but we have a alopecia program where we are able to grow new hair. So that one c is currently in phase three. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, we have another lotion where we are able to eliminate wrinkles. That one we partnered with a cosmetic company already. 
We have an inhaler that is able to reverse the scarring in the lungs for pulmonary fibrosis. We partnered that also with another pharma company. We have a psoriasis program and we have a... So these are all in the clinic, in human testing. And then we have a number of programs in our pipeline that are coming up. Uh, some of them more exciting than others. So our approach, we basically, you know, think, you can think of it as a spare parts business, right? As we age, we all have different parts of our bodies that age more than, you know, the rest of us, and we get diseases. In this case, you know, just like when you're driving a car, you wear out your tires, you put in new tires, and the car continues running as good as new. In this case, same way, you wear out your cartilage, we're working on a drug that regenerates cartilage, regenerate bone, regenerate muscle, brain tissue, the different parts of the body. So we go at uh, increasing health span, tissue by tissue, disease by disease, and in each case, the drug is optimized for the particular disease, for the particular tissue. So obviously, as you eliminate one disease after another, the immediate direct consequence is we are able to increase the health span, and indirectly, that allows us to live longer, in addition to living healthier. So that's the lifespan benefit. So the idea is, you know, we prefer to use the word de-aging, because anti-aging, you stop the aging process. We believe we are able to reverse it back to how the body had it when we were healthy. Thank you. Amazing, huh? How many folks did not know about Samumed before this presentation? <laughs> did not know? How many folks are super excited about what they're doing? Yeah. Thank you. So uh, let me, let me uh, bring out, uh, first off, my, uh, my co-host, Dr. Bob Hariri. Bob, come on out, brother. Um, let's also uh, bring out uh, Dr. David Caro and Dr. Amy Wagers. Uh, we've got the Doctors Club. All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Please take, take a seat. One more is coming out here. We'll, uh, so uh, I figure just a little bit of five minutes of conversation here and then please uh, line up. Bob, you want to throw out the first question perhaps to the group? So one of the interesting aspects of all the presentations is that there appears to be a soup out there that'll turn you younger, right? Uh, whether it's a combination of uh, factors that are elaborated by stem cells or signaling molecules that we need to better understand how to modulate systems, there's something out there we have a good handle on that could be administered um, uh, as, a, as a discrete therapeutic. I talked about cells, but there's also this discrete therapeutic opportunity. So I wanted to ask Amy, your work uh, and the work of your, uh, of your team uh, has focused, been very, very focused on a, on a, a, sol a very, very select uh, array of factors. Where else should we be looking? Hmm. So, so our work is focused on blood systemic factors because we think that they're particularly accessible. And I think that that, that turns out to be the case and that they have access for potentially cross-cutting applications. Um, I think the nervous system and the immune system are also, you know, fall in that same category. They connect different organ systems. They're important for coordinating responses that are physiologic and appropriate. Um, and they're clearly changing with time in, in ways that alter uh, the mechanisms that, that cells and organs communicate with one another. I think those are two areas that are obviously not mutually exclusive um, with each other or even with other circulating factors, stem cell derived factors, these sorts of things, but, but areas of interest. So the immune system obviously is, is a, plays a critical role in everything. And we have access to immune cells from, like you said, from blood. Uh, and there, there's, a, there's a lot going on now in using, uh, in engineering immune cells. Mm -hmm. You think there's any application of the, the new, co new technology in CAR T and um, uh, specifically targeting cells? Uh, absolutely. So this idea to harness the intrinsic protective functions of the immune system to eliminate damaged cells, for instance, that accumulate with age and can have negative consequences, eliminate senescent cells. Um, I think these are applications. They, 
they, they need the identification of specific and selective targets that the immune cells can, can I, you know, be attracted to. Um, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a promising area. Yeah. Dr. Caro, David, uh, the numbers you quoted that 40% of people coming in through the health nucleus, and these are wealthy individuals, right? They're paying 5,000 bucks, whatever the case might be. Um, 40% have a significant finding, and I think 14% need to take action on a finding. Do those, do those numbers sort of shock you? Uh, they, they do and they don't. Uh, you know, um, they, they, they do in the sense shock me uh, that, uh, you know, the 15% that have a clinically significant actionable finding, we didn't think it was going to be that high. And we thought we'd be finding tumors and aneurysms, but then we added up all the rare monogenic variants, the new BRCA1 mutations, uh, the new LMNA cardiomyopathies and so forth. But in a way, it doesn't shock me because we know that what has been guiding decision support for the last 30 years has been this very sort of superficial physical uh, that hasn't been very data driven uh, and hasn't been very deep or quantitative. So, you know, it's kind of like garbage in, garbage out. And the same goes for machine learning algorithms, right? If you're going to use machine learning algorithms to predict your risk for chronic age-related disease, you've really got to have high-quality, continuous, quantitative data in. And if you just have a lot of superficial data, uh, the outcome is not going to be very high. So, so uh, in a way, I don't think it's that surprising when you think about what the historical nature of our detection has been. So, uh, in the audience, I know there's a, there are a lot of practicing uh, physicians and other health healthcare providers. Uh, how many of you are using genomic data as part of your workup or part of your decision-making tree when managing your patients? Just a show of hands. So it's it's still still a relatively limited number. Um, what, what, I, I mean, I actually believe in, you know, I think this, I'll, I'll, again, I'll, I'll go back to you, David. I think at the end of the day, we have to be working to create uh, tools in the forms of applications. And I know that at HLI, we've been, we've been um, quite good at reducing very complicated computational uh, uh, processes into things like search engines and so on. Um, what, what do you think the best tool set would be for the general practicing pu public? Yeah, I mean, I, I would just make a comment before getting to your, uh, the answer to your question, which is that, you know, 3% of you raised your hand, you know, you're using genotyping as part of your practice. But in a way, the cat's out of the bag, right? Because there's a huge consumer genetic component, even a recreational genomic component that's growing rapidly. It's 23andMe with 5 million customers, Ancestry with 15 million, uh, and a number of others. Uh, so, you know, whether or not you're using it in your practice, your, 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 your patients are using it, uh, many of you uh, in the audience, I imagine, are 23andMe customers, so you're using that data. But unfortunately, a lot of that data, uh, just like the 30-year physical exam, is very superficial. And so that 23andMe chip looks at 700,000 markers of 6 billion base pairs. So, for example, uh, the BRCA gene, BRCA1 gene that's evaluated by 23andMe, did you know there's a thousand medically significant variants uh, of the BRCA gene, and 23andMe reports on three? So that's a stunning, sobering statistic. So to get to your answer to your question, Bob, it's, you know, we have to come up with sort of layperson-friendly algorithms that integrate this deep quantitative data in uh, meaningful ways. And I think that's what we tried to do at HLI, uh, is, you know, take six billion base pairs and distill it down to what does that mean for you? What does that mean for your risk in the next one year, five years? And based on that data, what's the number one thing I can do to mitigate my risk? And that's going to be super important. And by the way, a lot of that, we're not can be able to do as humans, it's AI machine learning algorithms. Dr. Kibar, Osman, uh, I mean, the results you're showing are extraordinary. And I, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked David. Uh, did they, are, are you surprised by how good the early results are in your WINT pathway manipulation? Surprised? <clears throat> Not really, because there has been a huge amount of literature, scientific work, on the wind pathway. So the translation from any one animal species into another has been established decades ago. Now, what we are specifically you know, trying to do is make sure we never ask the body to do something that the body didn't already know how to do. So when we are, let's say, we're talking about an injection that grows cartilage. We know for a fact that the body has the machinery, both the hardware and the software, 
that it has been regenerating that cartilage the right way all our lives. And then there comes a point where that signaling gets out of balance and it can no longer do that. So once we bring that signaling back into a healthy range, we don't have to force the body to do anything from there on. It's a chain reaction. The body knows exactly what to do. So the same approach actually applies across all tissues, all organs, but not just at the tissue level, but now we are, you know, one of our skunk works is we're focusing on cellular processes. The same way, there are a number of cellular processes associated with aging. As long as there was ever a period of time in our lifetimes where the body was able to reverse and restore the health at the cellular level, then we are pretty confident we can do it. Fantastic. Let me, our old age. I'm going to take a, a quick poll and I invite you to come to the microphone. Um, how many of you feel, you know, I'm, I'm, Bob and I wanted to bring uh, these three colleagues up on stage uh, to give you a, a sense of the different approaches towards longevity, right? From blood factors, from catching cancer, neurodegenerative disease uh, and heart disease early. So you can do something about it at stage zero. By the way, the, the comment, I don't want to know what's going on inside my body is such bullshit, right? Of course you want to know and you want to fix it right there at stage zero. Just yeah. to be very clear about that, right? It's, you're making yourself the CEO of your own health. And of course, wind signaling pathways. How many folks feel that after hearing this, that you believe there might actually be an extra 20 healthy years in your life? Can you see a show of hands? So, uh, and, I, and I believe that. I think we're gonna see in this next decade uh, an extension of the healthy human lifespan and vitality. Uh, this is gonna impact so many different factors in government, in insurance, in finance, in all of these things, right? So we have some questions, please. Thank you, Peter and uh, Bob for leading this revolution. So, uh, Bob, have you ever looked that when you have these stem cells that you're injecting, how does it affect GDF-11 or WNT signaling? Just curious if there's a connectivity. And Amy, there are 50 different growth hormones, and I know GDF-11 is one, and that's what you discovered. So what are your thoughts on like, combining other you know, hormones to amplify the effect? I know it's early stage. And uh, Osman, I mean, WNT is also a very dangerous pathway. So tell us a little bit about the danger. Yeah, now, Raj, I love that because it, it, it really <laughs> seemed like it was a setup question, right? But, you know, let me just, let me just say this. Um, our approach, which is to take uh, cells derived at the, at the instant of birth, uh, process, store them, and deliver them back in order to replace defective factors, influences everything that Amy and Osmond have been speaking about. We don't, as a matter of course, focus on specific discrete factors because we believe that the, the delivery system we have in the whole cell is quite effective. However, that being said, all of the work that this whole panel is, is, is doing helps contribute to the underlying uh, mechanistic understanding that we need to justify it to regulators, to opinion leaders, to clinicians, scientists, etc. And so I'm going to turn it over to Amy, but, but the bottom line is there's no doubt that these things play a role in cell therapy. It's just a different, a different way of delivering those factors. So, so I'm going to agree with Bob and say that this is a network that we're really looking into and it can be perturbed and manipulated from many different points. Uh, we have looked actually to specifically answer your question about stem cells in GDF-11. We've made knock-in mice to allow us to track producer cells of that particular protein and we don't think stem cells are a major source of GDF-11 but that's likely because it's made in many different tissues and many different cell types and stem cells are rare within those tissues. So in terms of um, the amount of contribution those particular cells themselves would have, it, it's low, but in that stem cells make the daughter cells that constitute the tissues that are the major producers, they're, they're an important uh, aspect of that regulation. Uh, in terms of other 
growth factors. Obviously, there, um, GDF11 is, is one of a very large family of growth factors. We know at least one of the um, other TGF family members also acts in a positive uh, manner uh, for promoting uh, rescue of remyelinating activity in the spinal cord. Uh, and so we, we think there may be some special place for this particular subfamily in regulating um, regenerative responses with aging. Uh, but there's also, it's also clear that non-TGF members, non-growth factor uh, signals, and also non-protein signals are going to be important. And ultimately, what we're hoping we'll build out is an understanding of all the key players, how they intersect with one another, um, and a predictive models for how a change in one would affect other uh, key regulators that we could then uh, have a better sense of how to intervene to set the system back to appropriate interaction. Osman, the dangers of manipulation of the wind pathway. So regarding wind safety. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so wind has been around for the last 35 years. And you know, if you do a PubMed search today, you get more than 30,000 articles on the wind pathway. So the, uh, the significance of the pathway is very well established. And because of that, since the early days, everybody has been trying to drug this pathway, come up with drugs. But so far, safety and efficacy have been mutually exclusive, you know, to your point about the safety of the wind pathway. What we have done differently is we actually identified a number of novel biological targets that people don't even know they belong in the wind pathway. And it turns out the gist of the uh, reason why it is possible to do it safely and efficaciously is because these targets are able to allow us to distinguish between healthy wind signaling and aberrant wind signaling. So if you mess with healthy signaling, yes, you will always run into side effects. Whereas with our targets, we are able to, you know, if the signaling has turned aberrant, it corrects it. But if it is healthy, the drugs are inert. They have no impact on the signaling at that point. And the proof is in the pudding. For example, you know, our most advanced one is osteoarthritis, the cartilage growing drug. To date, between our phase one, phase two, phase two B, and a number of long-term monitoring trials, we have dosed more than 1,000 patients, and we have not observed a single drug-related serious adverse event, not a single one. Amazing, amazing. So, let's, take a, let's take these three quick questions. We have five minutes left on the clock. Uh, hello, this is Federico from Guatemala. I w wanted to ask Dr. Bob Hinari, I don't have stem cells or placenta cells in storage for me. Can you use any stem cells from the placenta in anybody? So, so that's one of the, the elegant uh, uh, features of cells from the placenta. Um, I think I mentioned the placenta is nature's professional allograft. Okay? The placenta is designed to, in essence, exist in a, uh, in a foreign body for nine months without inducing a rejection response. Okay? So if you think about this, a mother is, contributes 50% of the DNA to the developing fetus. She carries it for nine months. She doesn't reject it. It doesn't reject her. Well, think about surrogate pregnancy. The mother is not even related to the fetus, and it carries it without that rejection response. We've treated hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of patients with placental cells that were never matched to the recipient. We've never had any event of a, a graft rejection response that was a significant cause of any toxicity. So that means that placental cells are one size fits all, and so we're all in luck because fortunately that, that platform is available to treat anyone. Next question, please. Yeah, Howard Baruch. I'm an orthopedic surgeon from New Jersey. This is my second of three courses with this year, and I've got to tell you, what you do is just remarkable. Just Love it. To thank you. My question is, as an orthopedic surgeon, orth spine, knees, this is really a big economic challenge. How do you see this tying into maybe specialty clinics for orthopedics and spine, and how we would be able to use that information and do it? Uh, uh, gentlemen, do you want to ask me to take it first, and David a little bit yourself? Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. <laughs> how, how, is, how are your treatments going to be used for in the orthopedics world ah, and, okay. and specialty clinics and so forth? What, yeah. Okay, so uh, you know, going back to the progenitor stem cells, 
mesenchymal stem cells, everything to do with the musculoskeletal system, right? So they know, for example, just because we call it a mesenchymal stem cell does not make it identical cells across the body. The mesenchymal stem cells in the knee joint, for example, grow a certain type of cartilage. The mesenchymal stem cells in the spine grow a different type of cartilage. But the same wind restorative medicine, let's say, the same wind, the same wind drug, the moment we trigger these molecules, the stem cells, I'm sorry, back into a healthy range, they do whatever they know how to do. Right, so the one in the spine grows a different type of cartilage that is suitable for a disc, whereas the other one for the joint. And we see this across all types of progenitor stem cells, right, dermal stem cells. We put the same lotion on our scalp, it grows hair. Same lotion, you put it over here, they've never grown hair, they cannot. Instead, they differentiate into fibroblasts, they release collagen, fills up the nooks and crooks, and we eliminate the wrinkles. So the stem cells know what their locale is and what they are responsible for in that location. David, a quick 30 yep. seconds. So, you know, I, I would just add that as, you know, as I presented our whole body protocol that's part of our precision health platform, we've really historically focused on five domains, neurovascular, neurodegenerative, cardiovascular, metabolic, and oncologic, but a sixth domain that we're working on, uh, and we're working actually with Siemens uh, on a whole body protocol for degenerative joint disease, really having precise measures of cartilage and so the idea would be before you get sort of bone on bone, we want to be able to use cellular therapy to regrow that cartilage, but you have to have precise ways, right, of measuring that cartilage pre and post. So, you know, we, again, we view kind of the minimally invasive cellular therapeutics as a natural partner of minimally invasive precision health analytics that can really give you diagnostics pre and post. So uh, I think in a way that's how, you know, sort of a cellularity clinic matches with a uh, precision We've got health one clinic. minute left. Last question. And I want to add just one thing, which is that yeah. orthopedic surgeons are, have been traditionally early adopters of cellular therapy and routinely use these products. So the truth is, you're going to wind up seeing these, these technologies earlier than others. Sir. Okay. 128 is the new 80, if you count in hexadecimal. <laughs> but my question is to Osman, if you have seen or ever tested any favorable effects with ultrasound, because it, it is known that ultrasound can actually heal bone, uh, fractures, wounds, and so on. Are you asking about the safety or the efficacy? Efficacy. Okay, because regarding safety, we have looked at the joint with X-ray, MRI, DEXA, CAT scan, and you know it's all clean. In terms of efficacy, currently the only clinically validated imaging modality. I'm that talking the about therapeutic ultrasound, not not imaging. Yes, yes. So uh, the only clinically validated imaging that is accepted by the FDA is X-ray. So we have looked at X-ray in all three of the previous clinical trials. And for the target patient population that we are going into our pivotal studies, we keep getting statistically significant and clinically significant X-ray results. Basically, medial joint space width increase. I hope this session has uplifted your personal expectations of your healthy lifespan. For that of your family, uh, I think this is something that uh, is the most exciting time ever to be alive. Please uh, help Bob and I thank our panel here. Can I, can I get you guys?